Hey, Marcus at MarcusBlankenship.com here. Yeah, I want to introduce today's clip. Uh, Jerry Weinberg and I chat on a regular basis, and um, last week we said, you know what? I bet other people would find our conversations about software, leadership, management, philosophy, teamwork, all the stuff that goes into our work, work lives to build great software kind of interesting and we just had a we just had a hunch so we're going to try and experiment we're going to create this youtube channel we don't have a name for it yet because jerry said let's let the audience name it you could if you watch this you hear us talk about that a little bit more at the end but i just wanted to give you an introduction introduction to it these are going to be weekly conversations that jerry and i have they are going to range all over the topics but you can guarantee it's going to be uh, a guy who wants to learn and uh, who's really interested in these topics talking with a seasoned expert in the field and you're going to get to listen in in addition, uh, we really want your feedback and we want your questions. If there's a particular topic you want Jerry and I to discuss, if you want his views or my views, you're probably going to get them both. Um, and so please email that idea, that question, that topic, anything to Marcus at MarcusBlankenship.com. We'll give those questions priority, the questions that come from you. And in exchange, we ask that you'd leave feedback on these YouTube videos, maybe pass them around. They are free. For us, it's a joy to be able to, to talk and hopefully to be able to help you as you grow in your engineering leadership and management, as you become the kind of supervisor that build the kind of culture that you're team really needs. That was well, that was poorly timed. Anyway, without further ado, we'll get into today's conversation. Please, again, last thing, if you have watched this, I want to hear, we both want to hear what you think we should call this show, this YouTube channel. We didn't know what to call it, um, so we'll simply wait for your ideas about how we should title this particular series that we're doing. Thanks. So I just got off the phone with somebody who went through one of the workshops. I've been calling them, asking people now that it's been six weeks, what other things have occurred to you? And I heard a term I'd never really heard before. A woman told me that she's trying to do less voluntelling his, her team things. And I thought this was kind of a funny phrase, voluntelling. And so I asked her what it meant. And she said, you know, it's a combination of someone who, well, she said like this, when no one volunteers, I just volunteer someone what to do. And I don't know if, so have you ever heard this term? Is this no. a common thing? No, I never heard this term. <laughs> and I don't like it. How, how come you don't like it? Well, it's, it's first of all, it's an oxymoron. Um, if they're volunteering, then you don't tell them. And if you're telling, they're not volunteering. So what are they? That's what, true. Yourself or what? This is a typical management, uh, fool, fool oneself uh, deal. You give some new word and uh, it doesn't mean anything. It means something that is impossible. I mean, People either volunteer or they do uh, in order to do something. And uh, I, I'm going to order you to volunteer. That's what it's right. Exactly. I've told you to volunteer. And uh, she actually used it in the past tense. She said, "Well, I end up doing." She said, and so she said, I'll, "I voluntold a lot of people." that they need to do something because it needs to be done and no one really wants to do the dirty work project or the unfun or no one wants to volunteer for that duty is the way I she's ask for a volunteer and ask in a way that it's really up to them or you can ask in such a way that it's like if you don't volunteer you're in serious trouble yeah, yeah, and and uh, she said she was working on not doing this volunteering thing, which I was glad. That, but when I asked her why she needed to, she said, "Well, when I ask for volunteers, everyone just looks at me for a moment, and I'll finally just choose someone." Well, yeah. See, they make make a game out of it. One of the things. You want to learn to do as a manager is to de-game various activities that go on in the group. All right. In other words, she says, uh, I need a volunteer, and then she looks and looks at people 
and they look at her and they look where she, her body posture and where she's looking and so on. Is it me that she wants to volunteer? Am I supposed to do this? Well, uh, so one of the things that you, it's like in a class, you know, you ask who has a comment to make right? or who's going to answer to the problem or who's going to talk about the homework. And actually, people have devices. I used to have one, uh, uh, like a, a spinner. Uh, one way to do it is to you know, spinner and this is, okay, I need someone to talk about their homework. And you don't want to go by who sticks their hand up first because it's always the same person. Right. You don't want to pick the one who seems to be hiding and just to embarrass them. You want to make it so that nobody knows who's going to be picked. So they have to all be ready. You see, so you spin the spinner and it's you. Okay, that's it. I mean, I didn't do it. We just didn't do that. I, I use now a deck of cards. Okay. Uh, everybody, I just shuffle them, deal out the cards and say, okay, who's got ace? And they go first. So, but, but it isn't always the ace. So when you get your card, you don't know you're going to be called that. I'll just, uh, just say, who's got the four? Yeah. And, and it, so I am not determining who has to, what, what was the term? Voluntel. Voluntel. Voluntold. Whatever it is, past tense. Yeah. yeah I don't have to do that. Uh, and I'm just saying we all have an equal chance of being called upon. Um, so it, it, in, what you're saying is, and I never thought about this, that it's actually preferable to use a random method, a dice, a deck of cards, uh, a spinner, you didn't say a dice, but whatever it is, something that indicates over, I mean, to me, I, what I hear is over a period of time, we'll all get a turn. Mm -hmm. And that's actually preferable to, to somebody saying, Jim, I know you, that you did, I know that you know how to do this. You did a great job last time. Like, would you just do it again? Like, and Jim goes, oh, well, I guess I will. I'll volunteer for it or something. You see, studies have shown that in, the, in school, uh, teachers tend, when they do that, they say, oh, ask for the answer. They tend to call on boys over girls. And they actually study this statistically. Mm. They don't know they're doing that. You know, they think they're picking at random. But uh, so they want, you want to de-game that. I mean, so give everybody an equal chance. It doesn't have to be a negative thing. I mean, I, I need a volunteer to clean the toilet. You know, I mean, okay. Presumably that's not something everybody wants to do. But it's also I want to volunteer to talk about their solution to this problem. And uh, get a chance to show off for the teacher, but you don't want to keep picking the same people all the time. Unconsciously. Yeah. And I know, I could imagine if you're a leader, one of the things you're faced with is you're busy. So, and by leader, let's use the phrase manager. If you're managing this way, it might be because A, you're really busy, you just need to get stuff done. You might be volunteering the people who either A, you, you feel will accept without too much complaint, or mm -hmm. I guess B, maybe they've done it in the past, they did a good enough job that you won't have to clean up it, clean, clean it up or uh, fix a problem. And, and it seems like those two groups of people are gonna get called on. Right, and, and of course, you, that leads now to the piling on dynamic, which I've described in some of my books. That uh, you, When you start thinking, well, gee, uh, Marcus did a really good job on this before, so I'm gonna call him again. Yeah. Uh, or whether you do that consciously or unconsciously, and pretty soon Marcus is overloaded with all kinds of stuff, and other people are not getting a chance. So on the one hand, you're overloading one person. You, on the other hand, nobody else is learning how to do this, and you're not finding out who else is capable, and so on, and it creates a lot of unhappiness. So by de-gaming it, uh, you spread the, you know, the opportunities around, opportunities to learn, opportunities to show off to the boss, or opportunities to show that, well, maybe you're not capable of doing this, as opposed to the boss just assuming you're not, because, gee, he never does this. Oh, gee, I never call on him. 
Right. You know, and I've been the over, I, I can remember a time when I was a young programmer, very agreeable, wanting to please, you know, that's my nature. I really want to make people happy, especially if you're a boss or something. And I just kept getting all kinds of little requests. They weren't on the big project sheet. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, according to the project matrix, it looked well balanced, but Marcus was also doing X and Y and Z because he was agreeable and not entirely incompetent. So that was really stressful for me. Like I remember feeling like, I, you know, the penalty for doing a good job was getting more work and being overloaded and having more stress and all those other things. Yep. So, so much for the new word. Let's get it out of our vocabulary. No more voluntelling if you're listening to this. Well, yeah, except... You know, it's good. It's a good word in the sense that it's like uh, the term uh, "screwing up." You know, you want to learn if you're a screw up. You'd like to know that. No, we don't talk about screwing up, so nobody ever know that they're a screw up. <laughs> nobody ever know they're a volunteer. Since they didn't have a word for it, it's like, oh, I can't be doing that. Right? It doesn't exist. So it's good to have a word that describes a behavior that some people are doing, even if that behavior isn't what is the optimal, isn't what we want, we still have to have a way to sort of describe the the situation. It brings it to the surface, at least at the forefront of our minds, and maybe that's a step into getting some different behavior, like to get some dice or a deck of cards or a spinner or whatever, to de-game the thing. I like the de-gaming idea. I'm going to write that down. The other person I spoke to about the workshop who gave me feedback on it talked about how he, it showed him the importance of, and this surprised me, of patience. Mm-hmm. He said, I saw you asking why in the workshop, and then you just sat there. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it seemed like it took a long time for anyone to reply, but you just waited us out. And it dawned on me, I'm not very patient. I, if I don't get a why, or if something doesn't come really quickly to the group, I just interject and keep talking and talking. And I'm trying to ask, he said, I'm trying to ask why, and I'm trying to be patient. And he said that was, that was harder than he thought, but it said his team was really it really seemed to be impacting them in a positive way. Yeah, see, that, that fits together with the uh, volunteering, right? Because if you, uh, one of the reasons you don't get real volunteers is that you're too quick. Mm. And it also creates another gaming situation where we know that Marcus has no patience if he asks for something he has to, if he doesn't get an answer in a tenth of a second, he'll just throw in his own answer. And uh, one of the things you learn as a group leader or team leader or manager or whatever is when you're working with the group, you want to be the last one to answer. This That's is, a pretty good rule. I was say, you know, like you say to the group, go take something pretty innocent. Uh, where should we go for lunch? Okay, let's go to Rudy's. Right. My suggestion is we go to, well, once the manager or the boss has made that suggestion, uh, now you have to you have another idea. Like you're a vegetarian, you don't want to go to the world's best barbecue place because you can't get any meat there. But, but the boss has kind of laid that down. And you, uh, so your, your behavior is affecting the group, not in a way that, you desire it to be. I mean, if, if you really want them to choose where they want to go to lunch, then you have to stop doing what they have. You, have, you have to just hold your... On the other hand, if, if you say, I really have this taste for Rudy's barbecue right now, and that's where I really want to go, then be upfront about it. Be honest about it. Don't say, where should we go? You say, I really have a taste for Rudy's barbecue right now. I, uh, I'd like to go there. And then you could say, is, does anybody have a problem with that? And then the vegetarian. So when you speak about what you want, 
Do you feel like that also shows the team it's okay for them to talk yeah. about, like, like somebody says, I'm a vegetarian. Yeah, I mean, what you have to do is when it's about what you want, you have to tell them it's what you want instead of playing this game. So you're gaming again. Oh, let's everybody say what they like, but I'll say first, <laughs> quote, if you contradict me, you're in trouble. So that's, uh, and that's a, another term that, that you want to know but people know the term, but they don't realize they're doing it, is micromanaging. Mm -hmm. That's micromanaging. Like you're determining where the group's going to lunch. I mean, that's not a... I mean, if the person, you say to a manager, now, I noticed what you did was, you said, we're going to lunch at Rudy's. Now, that's, they said, oh, yeah, I wouldn't do that. You know, I don't want to order but I say, all right, where should we go to lunch? I'd like to go to Rudy's or, or where should we go to lunch? How about Rudy's? You're doing the same thing and you're covering it up. You're gaming it. See? So, you're, so, you're basically telling them, this is what I'm choosing. So you better do it. Yeah. I, and I, a lot of people I talk to, and I bet you have heard this too, really fear they fear being a micromanager. They have a, I mean, it has a very bad reputation generally. It probably should. But I think a lot of people would say, well, that's the last, I'm not a micromanager and I never want to be one. Um, what, they mean is, what they're saying is I, I didn't intend to be a micromanager, right? Right. Uh, let's say you're somebody who's washing dishes and you break a lot of dishes. You say, I never intended to break a lot of dishes. Well, of course you didn't intend to break you know, a lot of dishes. But, but the fact is, that's what you're doing. Yes. I mean, it's costing us a fortune in broken dishes. In plates, yeah. And, and so the question is, how do you do something different? So you don't intend to micromanage. That's great. That's a good starting point. You say, fine. If you don't intend to micromanage and you think that's not a good thing, let's look at areas where you might be micromanaging and not realizing it. And I suppose lunch is one area, but uh, as this other person told me today, when, in this kind of full circle, when he asks, um, when he asks his team something and he waits a tenth of a second and then does a lot, does the telling, he's, uh, he, to him, I think it felt like a question because he asked. Mm -hmm. And I bet to his team, it didn't really feel much like a question though. That's right. That's right. Um, there's certain, that's one of the common forms of micromanaging. Another form, of course, is where you have ask, you, you tell somebody to do something, which is okay, yeah, it's fine. If there's a job to do, somebody has to uh, go through the records and look for certain problems. Sure. And Marcus, you're going to do this. And uh, instead of saying that, you say, hey, Marcus, you're going to go look, look at record number one and then see if there's a problem, then look at record number two and three and go through them in sequence and find out. And now you're micromanaging because maybe Marcus wants to start with the last record. And go ah, or sort them in alphabetical order, not by sequence idea, whatever it is, right? I mean, you're telling them how to do it, not what to do. Not what to do. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we. I think we. Well, we Marcus, you're not smart enough to know which order to go in. That's what I'm telling you, right? Well, and uh, I have a system devised that'll make sure we go through all of them. You should use my system. We'll start at the lowest number and we'll yeah, go well, from one to a thousand. Of course, you don't say it in so many words, and uh, and it's a problem. I mean, I way, 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 way back when I. You know, took a job when I was in school, I took a summer job doing uh, material requirements in a bakery. And my boss was the guy who had the job before me, and he'd been promoted. And it took him uh, eight hours to do this job every day. And I did it in less than an hour. And that's a problem for an employee. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I learned about that. That's a major problem. You embarrass the boss. But if the boss doesn't tell you how to do it, 
then you find your way to do it and it happens to be a better way than the boss did at least you have a chance there so did your boss tell you how to do it oh yeah he instructed me how it's done how he had done it for all those years i don't know how it's done how it's done Meaning, if this is like from God, the message. Is, <laughs> okay. If that was how I used to do it. This yeah. is how it's done. It's done, right? That feels like uh, if you're if you're wondering if you are a micromanager, I wonder if that bit of speech is something to listen for. If you're saying how it's done, well, how we do it might be a variation. Generally speaking, when you use it. In, uh, in a sentence like that, when you're giving instructions, um, it has to be done like this. It, it's better to do this way. Right. Subs take off the T and the S and say what you really mean. I, I. I do it this way. <laughs> My, right. so it, is a, you know, there's no, it is a pronoun. It's supposed to refer to something. Some noun. <clears throat> I'm having sense with it. <laughs> I'm having flashbacks, and I'm I'm thinking back to a time when I said um, either I said this is the way we do it, or it's done like this, or around here we do it that way. And really, I had a, a system in my head that I had devised a plan of attack, a way of doing it that I was comfortable with because I could understand it. And then I held, I was confident in the system, the way it was done, because I had devised it, and I had done it hundreds of times. I didn't really need to have any confidence in the other person other than if I could just get them to do it the way I did it, then I would feel comfortable with it. Yeah, but I don't feel comfortable at all. Not at all. We certainly aren't going to have any new ideas or innovation or speed up or we're just going well, to keep doing well, it. Yeah, but it, it, it simply may not work for them. I, I think about Ted Williams, the baseball player. I don't know if you remember who Ted Williams was. Sure. He was one of the great, he was the last major leaguer to ever bat 400 in a season. Mm. It's been a long time. It has. So he became a batting coach when he was not playing anymore. And he would tell people, he says, well, here's how you, you tell whether it's going to be a curveball or not. He says, you look at the seams as the ball is coming and which way the this, this seams are turning. As the ball is coming, and that tells you what, the way it's going to break. Well, Ted Williams had, that was his method. Right. right? But nobody else could do it because he had eyesight that was so incredible. I mean, whoever seen the way that the laces are turning on a ball when it's being thrown and you're trying to hit it. So you're, it may make you comfortable when you do it this, this way, but you have no idea whether that fits for the person who you're having do it, right? See? That, yeah. Yeah. Also, you, you had another expression. Uh, there's the it, and then there's the... Well, we do it this way. The we. If you're we, a part of us, we do it this way. We, when you use we, when you're referring to yourself, <laughs> you're the king of England. The royal we? Is that what that phrase is? Or you're schizophrenic. Oh. <laughs> uh, neither of which seems to be, hopefully is true, right? Um, so, you know, these, these are little ways that we hide that we're micromanaging and, um, and, and we don't notice what we're doing. Yeah. Now, we're, we're talking a lot about when we're uh, interacting with people. Um, I, I wonder if, I mean, this, is, this is certainly applies to, to code. Um, from the pers I, I, maybe I'm asking the question, like I'm imagining as a, somebody who is overseeing a group of programmers, leading a group of programmers, hopefully managing programming projects. If I am doing technical reviews or if I am sitting in any kind of review, if I'm observing the work output, the code that's written, and it's not the way I would do it, mm -hmm. I have a an opportunity, a challenge. Uh, I see this as a place where a lot of a lot of people tend to say, "Well, I like again, I like it done 
this way. We around here, we do it that way. Um, but maybe the code it executes just fine. Maybe it accomplishes the task. Where is a place for preference from a leader's perspective, I guess? Well, you have to decide, is it important? I mean, what's the importance of doing it a certain way? Like you, and, and you want to start a lot of your statements see, with how important it is. Take it away from the code for a second and let's say, um, boss comes in and Mario says, um, I really like it when all the waste baskets are empty at the beginning of the day. Okay. So you've got some rush job that the customer is waiting, their whole organization is waiting for the payroll, and here's your people are entering waste baskets. And they said, Well, you said you really like it, you know. And, um, it, the statement really gives no importance to it. Like, well, there's a fire in the building and we're supposed to, but I have, you haven't emptied the waste baskets yet. So I'll stay here and be burned to death because you said you really like it at the waste basket. You know, uh, uh, so if you're okay, now take that to we're, we're doing a code review. And first of all, if you're the manager, why are you in the code review? That's a good question. Okay, so that's the big question. You shouldn't even be there in the first place. Shouldn't even be at the code review? No, you're always a wise manager looking at code. Well, okay. I'll, I'll, so, so now we get the managers out of the room. We're left with the programmers, right? All right. So you're a programmer, and you might be one of those double positions where you're supposed to be a programmer and a team leader. And it, yeah, those are fun. Okay. So you see some code, and you think something about it. First of all, the simple case is where it doesn't do the job. Mm -hmm. It's code is supposed to sort this array, and it doesn't sort the array, or in some cases, it doesn't sort the array correctly. Well, that's straightforward. You say, well, uh, from what I can see, that code will not always sort the array correctly. That's perfectly legitimate, and uh, you uh, you also phrase it in such a way. Oh, maybe I'm wrong. Let's examine this sure. and, and see if it really does. All right. That's why you're there in the review. Okay. Now, switch to it's a matter of style. Oh, this sorts the array perfectly. Um, well, maybe, maybe, let's say, not so maybe it's performance. It takes two hours to sort 10 items. Right. Uh, uh, that's, well, does it matter? No, okay, usually it's not two hours because it's just, it, this takes two milliseconds to sort these items. And I could do it in one millisecond. And you think, well, you know, is that important? I mean, this person is online waiting for this sort. Would it, would any human being be able to notice the difference between a two millisecond sort and a one millisecond sort? Right. And if the answer is no, you don't say anything there. You don't say anything there. Because it's not part of the business of the, re the review is to see whether the code does what it's supposed to do. Now, what is it supposed to do? Okay, it's, it's supposed to get this array in order. That's the first thing. It's supposed to do it in a way that doesn't make the person using the system go to sleep waiting for it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you say, yeah, but there might be other cases where we have an array where my method will be much faster and it will be important. Okay. Yes, that's fine. So what you have, you're talking about, but you're not talking about this code at this time in this review, ah. you're talking about the future. Now you're in the teaching mode. All right. And yes, you learn a lot in, in code reviews. That's a major function, but what you do is you spot this difference and outside the code review, you, or after the code, you're sitting there and you do a post review. You say, one of the things I noticed is that the algorithm you used for sorting that array, it worked just fine in this situation. Sometimes 
you have a situation where it's a much larger array, mm -hmm. much the bigger items, and you may need to sort faster. Um, have you ever run into that? We said, yeah, we see that. Or, well, I know an algorithm that would work better in that case. And then, there's, and then, then you discuss it as equals. It's not a criticism of the code because the code was perfectly fine right. for its job, did the job, right? And you say, okay, so, so then, then you get into the discussion and you say, well, you know, I didn't use that. Uh, I know that algorithm. I didn't use it here because it takes three times as much code and it's more complex and harder to maintain and it wasn't required. Oh, good choice. Good choice, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. It's it seems like this uh, giving technical feedback. You you you. So so far you've sort of said we got to kick the managers out of the room. Yeah, they they're not really in there. This is a peer because then it becomes a review of the person. You see, ah. it's like uh, I'm sitting here as a manager thinking, should I give this guy a raise or should I hire him? I look at him and go, that isn't the way you do that as a manager, right? You look at results. Sure. I have certainly had programmers who um, spent, so they, they got it from the two hours to the two milliseconds in your example. Mm -hmm. And then they, without having a conversation, they spent a number of hours getting it down to the one millisecond yeah. because they were wanting to make it, uh, they used words like elegant, optimized, fast, efficient. Uh, yeah, they went to great lengths to do what they felt was the very beautiful thing. And yet looking in hindsight, I would have been perfectly happy for the two millisecond version, the built-in sort function, not the customized one. And you see, what happens if a manager is in the room when you're doing a review, then the programmer is trying to do two things, at least. One is things have code that works. Does okay. It. And the other is I'm trying to impress the manager so I get a raise. All right. All right. And which is the higher priority? Mm. <laughs> well, um, one is very much attached to my pocketbook and my wife would be very happy if I came home with a raise. And the other one is, so yeah, I am, if the manager's in the room, I'm always primarily concerned about impressing or at least preserving yeah. my status don't with them. Don't yeah. look bad. So if somebody yeah. says something, you know, uh, well, you know, somebody in the room says, uh, well, that uh, sort routine you have uh, could be faster. The manager's watching this and then you start in defending the code. Yeah. And, they, and you get in his argument. Now, the other guy is also now has a chance to show off to the manager. You see, I know how to write code better than this guy does. And, and it becomes a, a, a drama. Mm. Oh. So a lot it, of people have trouble with reviews because they have someone in the room they're trying to impress. Now, it's true, you might be trying to impress your fellow programmers, even if there's no manager in the room. But yeah. that's a different level. At least, uh, see, this is this is your colleagues, right? Your coworkers, and you'd like them to think well of you. Okay, sure. uh, that's that's reasonable. I mean, it's reasonable for your manager to think well of you too, but this isn't the place to do it. Well, if you're you mentioned this dual role, this tech lead, team lead, this person who writes code some amount of the time with the team contributing to the project and then also has this other responsibility of what do you call it management or leadership i see this very commonly and yet oftentimes that's where i that was my first step into it i had to do the code review that was what i was tasked with my boss said don't let any bugs get by you need to read every line of code so that's what i did at 11 o'clock at night which is clearly the best time to find bugs um but you know, the way you're kind of framing it here, my people, if we had done a code review together, would have absolutely felt that, I'm sure they did feel that tension between I have to make it work and I have to keep Marcus, you know, happy. Even though he doesn't have a big M in his name as a manager, he's somewhat appointed over me. Mm -hmm. yeah. How can I create an environment where we can be peers in a review setting? 
Well, first, first of all, you do it in public instead of going off by yourself at night reading card. You do it in public so that if you do something stupid, everybody else sees that you're stupid too, just like the rest of us. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, the very beginning of this is if you are a code writer, see who was up at 11 o'clock reading your code? Right, yes. Uh, often nobody. Unfortunately. Right? So which means I introduced a lot of bugs. I hate to say uh, it. Aside from that, you're also saying I'm superior to you. Yes. Nobody gets to review my code. I've thrown people off teams because they say that. They say, well, I'll be happy to tell you what's wrong with your code, but nobody looks at my code. As soon as they start saying my code, uh, you don't want them around. I've seen this where junior people had to have their code reviewed, but senior people got to skip that step. Yeah, no, that is so. You see, it's, it's so wrong. I mean, it's like senior people can't make mistakes. Right. Come on. You know, people who are insecure, uh, low self-esteem, they want to have themselves protected from any embarrassment that anybody might see my code. And that's the main reason why you don't want managers in a code review. If they don't write code, or they don't write code that other that goes through the same review process. Right. Probably. This is like the parent. You know, I see where some parent is lecturing their child about not smoking. And <laughs> while they're lecturing, they're smoking a cigarette. Yes. It sounds a little bit like my past. <laughs> it's a filthy habit. Don't have habit. Don't don't ever pick it up, you know. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, you, you're modeling. If you want to lead a team, the number one strongest way of leading by far over all the other things you might do is by what you do. If you write code and it doesn't have to be reviewed, like everybody else's, then you're modeling. And I'm saying you would be a better programmer, you should have code that we don't have to review. Well, nobody has code you don't have to review. Nobody. I've been in the business more than half a century. I've looked at thousands of programs. Right? I've never met, I've met some really great programmers. And the really good ones know that their stuff has to be reviewed. That's one of the marks of a good programmer. And anybody tells me, I, I'm, I, I literally have thrown people out of groups because they refuse to let somebody review it. I'm going to tell that story. Maybe I told you this. I think I've written it. I was working, uh, consulting with um, Rolls-Royce in England, the, uh, the aircraft engine part of Rolls-Royce, not the car place, right? Um, and they, I usually don't mention the names of my clients, but this is, you know, this is nothing wrong with them. Uh, they, had, they had lots of people writing code and, um, they were unhappy with the errors, of course. And uh, so I was teaching them some things to cut down the errors. And one of them was code reviewing, which they been, hadn't been doing. And um, so they instituted them and said, okay, we're gonna review, all code will be reviewed. And three out of maybe several hundred programmers they had said they wouldn't allow anybody to review their code. And my, the manager's thought, first thought was, let's just fire those three, you know. I mean, who the hell do they think they are? Right. Um, well, so I said, well, let's look at it individually. And um, they were um, all thought to be very good programmers, you know, so they were a little concerned about just losing them. Sure. And I said, I, we brought them in and I, I offered them a deal. I got the manager to offer them a deal. You don't have to have your code reviewed. You don't want it reviewed. But uh, so so that's fine. But if you, if your code turns up an error in, in when we're using it and it costs us money, all right, then we'll deduct that from your salary. Seems very fair. Isn't that fair? It seems like it. And they agreed. 
All three of them did? All three of them. Okay. Great. All right. Well, no, actually, no, not all three. One of them said, oh, okay, I'll have my code with you. <laughs> <laughs> Immediately, he was on board. He was on board. You know, well, he was reluctant, but he knew. Yeah. The other two they seemed, what I would call arrogant or whatever. And they said, okay. And one of them, on the very first code, uh, there was a mistake. They had to rerun a bunch of stuff and destroyed some files. And they brought him in and they said, well, uh, looks like you're going to be working for us for the next 20 years free. Uh, I... <laughs> and so he quit. I, I, I just, he was done. He's, and did they, they just said he forgave or they forgave that debt or whatever. He was done though. Yeah. You didn't have to fire him. And uh, the word was around and this guy. Other people knew that the other programmers knew that he was, yeah. he just thought he was good. And, ah. But the third guy was a problem because he accepted the deal and he wrote one program and it was fine. And he had another program, it was fine. And another program was fine. It went on for almost a year and every, he was really good. And then one day something went wrong and he wiped out some master file. And they brought him in. They said, look, it's not like this other guy that, that quit. I mean, you clearly demonstrated that you could almost do a perfect job. But that's not good enough. Because now, if, we, if you had to pay for recovering what you had destroyed, you, you'd be working for free for the rest of your life. Wow. And, uh, but we don't want you to leave. we just like you to do code reviewing and have people read your code so they learn from it because it's so good. And he accepted that reframing. And I was going to say, that's a nice reframing, right? Yeah. yeah. It's not just, you know, to find things wrong with it. It's to, to show it to the world. I uh, get a feeling there's a theme here that we have an underlying belief that just perfectionism, perfection doesn't exist, that these problems, we, as humans, we're going to make errors. Of course. Of I course. Mean, who, how could you believe otherwise? <laughs> I mean, you try that in a room and you have a bunch of people, it could be a thousand people at a conference, and say, stand up if you never made a mistake. You won't see anybody standing up. You'll see a couple uncomfortable people who would like to stand up, but they realize <laughs> they'll be ridiculed by everyone else. Right, right. Or, uh, um, I did this once, and some guy stood up in the company, it wasn't moved, and he stood up, and, and they started, like five different people in the room started saying, what about when you did this? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, if you can't remember your mistake, we can. We'll help you remember that. Yeah, he was the kind of guy who, uh, like that first guy of the three, who, who was just lousy and didn't realize how lousy he was. He always had an alibi for, well, it wasn't my fault, you know, the machine didn't like my code yeah. <laughs> or whatever. Right. Compiled and worked on my machine, but. Well, I, had, I was doing fine and somebody interrupted me. And I got distracted. I didn't really make a mistake. It was really their fault. And there are people like that. They, you know, we can all do that, right? Yeah. But then you get caught doing something stupid. And your first instinct is to say, well, it wasn't really me. Right. Um, well, we don't need that. I mean, that's, that's, not, that's not helpful in programming. The first, the Chinese have a saying, or so I've been told, the first step to knowledge is a confession of ignorance. That's pretty good. I don't see very many workplaces being comfortable with a confession of ignorance, let alone a mistake that doesn't have a penalty uh, attached to it. Well, see, that's what we, we, why we've written about the blaming organization. And what happens is when the organization is in the habit of blaming for stuff, then people tend to hide stuff right. hide from you and they hide it from themselves. And you want an organization where we're trying to write code that works properly and does what it's supposed to do. 
And um, sometimes we make mistakes because we're human beings. And the thing we want to do is expose those mistakes to the fresh air. I saw, I saw this expression the other day. Um, uh, sunshine is, is the best cure for disease. Something like that. You know, I mean, it's yeah. all kinds of ailments if you just get out some fresh air. It's the same way. I mean, bugs and programs, errors and programs, uh, live like bugs under a rock. You know, if you pick up the rock and the sun shines, all those bugs die. <coughs> but as long as they're covered by the rock, all kinds of stuff is going on under there. Yeah. I know when I first heard my boss, I think it was in the 90s, he was taking a Six Sigma training or he was learning about five whys. I don't know, maybe I'm confused, but I got the impression he was gaining frameworks and skills which would be used to uh, root out the problems, to get to the bottom of things. And I, I got really afraid that he might use that on me. I thought, well, what's going to happen when it turns out that it, it sort of comes to light that I, I've i made mistakes, like this idea of getting to the root cause. Like at some point, it's going to be the finger pointed, Marcus, you're the root cause of this mistake. And so, you, you know, the rest of us here don't do that. You got to go was mm -hmm. always seemed to be a concern of mine with this root cause business. Well, another, another Chinese saying that I like, which again, who knows if Chinese really say these things, when you're pointing your finger, point your finger at me now. Now notice where your other fingers are pointing. Right back at me. Mm -hmm. So your boss is the guy who hired you and who manages you. And if you make bad mistakes and cause a lot of trouble, uh, whose fault is that? If you know your fault. That, and this is exactly the dynamic that caused us not to okay, not to fire people very often, not to even talk about a discipline plan, an improvement plan, because as soon as we were, uh, we can't, we would come to our boss with kind of at the end of our rope, like, you know, Susie just isn't working out and we've tried X, Y, and Z. And uh, my boss would say, well, you have to build a case that shows that you've done everything you could. And because there's going to be a lot of hard questions about why you, the manager, hired this incompetent person, allowed incompetence to stay so long. All, all kinds of blaming would get to happen. You don't succeed. And you say, we tried X, Y, and Z. Well, you're obviously the incompetent one because if you were a competent <laughs> manager, right. you tried A, B, and C, and one of them would have worked. Right. You, maybe you should. And that's exactly right. You clearly, you're the problem, Marcus. If, and if you have two people leave your team in a year, then you must be driving them away with your whatever. Yeah, my now I'm getting stressed out remembering <laughs> those <laughs> situations. <laughs> but a lot of people are trapped between a, a boss and a team, and I think they feel very there's a lot of pressure from above, and their team is like there's a lot of pressure from below the team, too. And well, and that's based on the belief that pressure is the way you solve problems. All right, so if you have a programmer who's making mistakes, then that would tell you what you do is you stand over his shoulder with a gun and say, if you make a mistake, well, I'm watching you here, I'm going to shoot you in the head. And that, that will improve their behavior, right? That will change their behavior for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, more pressure, right? It'd actually be better if, you, if they work with one hand and while you're twisting the other behind their back. I remember when I had a manager, a peer of mine come to me and I asked him, you know, how is your team? He was kind of new. And he said, I'm really gotten to the point where I can put the pedal down and that team revs into gear. And when I need them, they're like a, they're like a high performance race car. I can put that pedal down whenever I want. And they all just jump to attention and just do whatever it takes to get it done. And I thought, I never thought of my team like that before. And really never found it to be terribly useful, but uh, evidently that's, he thought of it as a machine that he could no, well, turn. The first, thing, first thing that's wrong is this guy has obviously never driven a high performance race car. He, no, he never had. Because you can't just slam down on the, on the pedal and the 
and drive that way and, and succeed. That this is the way it works. You have to know how the car works when you can push down the pedal, when you ease off, when, and so on. I mean, this, um, I, uh, for example, uh, not necessarily a high performance car, but we go up in the mountains and it's been raining and people are up there with their four wheel drive yeah. vehicle or whatever, and yeah. they get stuck in a mud hole and they just push the pedal down and dig the hole deeper and dig it deeper and dig it deeper. And finally, some truck has to come up and pull them out. Yep. Yep. They think that's all you have to do is push on the pedal. Well, they have I, one control. They just this. That's the only thing they seem to know how to do. And this all the way down. When I get that, I tell them, I said, well, you're not, you know, you have a model of management and you're not really using it because you, you where's your gun? Back to the gun. Or, or, or so I can't kill people. Said, well, all right, get a cattle prod. Oh, man. Well, this is the old threat reward, right? When they're not performing the way you want them to, just prod them, you know, give them a few jolts of electricity and, um, or taser, I guess now. You know, and, and, and certainly they'll do better, right? Well, they'll be different. Most managers uh, understand that hitting a programmer with a cattle prod is not going to make them do better at all. What they don't understand is that screaming at them and, and uh, threatening them right. is just the equivalent of a cattle prod. The emotional cattle prod. And cattle prods actually aren't the best way to deal with cattle either. And of course, they've not dealt with cattle and they don't know. But I've had experience up in the Swiss Alps with the cattle. And these are, these are often fighting cows. They're what kind of cows? Fighting. Fighting cows? They, have, they, they go up in the spring and they get the cows all fight until one of them emerges as the queen. Oh. And, but, but I can handle them I, without a prod or anything but my words and tone of voice and body posture and so on. So, um, well, managers who talk like that simply do don't know what they're doing. That's all. There's a lot of people, a lot of people, including you and me, there are a lot of times when we don't know what we're doing. That so is very true. And we're falling back. And I know we've talked about this before, old, old models of education, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the teachers at the front, we have threat reward systems, we learn the A's and the F's. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, you do well, you get a promotion, you do poorly, you get fired. They're when we don't know what we're doing, it's very easy to sort of just do what we saw somebody else do or what, um, what was done to us. Bertrand Russell had a wonderful saying. In times of stress, it's difficult to refuse infantile suggestions. <laughs> I think I read that in one of your books, actually. Yeah, I mean, you know, okay, I'm in stress. I don't know what to do. I'm, People are putting pressure on me as the manager to get stuff delivered. Out of but now I don't have any clue what to do. I'm stressed. So somebody gives me an infantile suggestion. Get a cattle prod. Oh, okay. So I don't resist that. You know? Yeah. Maybe a way to deal with things like Marcus's turning out code it's much too slowly, you know, getting it out, and when it comes out, it's got a lot of errors. And I go to Marcus and say, Marcus, here's what I'm observing. Right? You must have been scheduled it to come out January 1st, and now it's January 10th, or whatever, right? and you still don't have it. And the last stuff you brought us, you shipped it and it had all these bugs. Is that what you see? That's the first step. Because then they go into denial. Well, I never said January 1st. Right. 
You said January 1st. That was your date, not mine or whatever. I said January 10th, but you dropped the zero. <laughs> you know, you're such a stupid manager. You know, you know, whatever. I mean, so you first got to get the facts agreed upon. Right. If you don't agree with the facts. You have to check that what did in fact say January 10th or we say January 1st. Because if you don't have agreement on that, you're going nowhere. Right. I didn't do anything wrong. I'm right on schedule. Yeah. And if, it, and if it was supposed to be the 20th, I'm ahead. Mm -hmm. So once you have the facts, how do you move to, I, maybe you think about it as joint problem solving, collaborating around a, a third problem, which isn't that he's bad and that you're good or whatever. Well, then you have to ask about the consequences. Okay, so we agree. You said you'd have it on the 1st, and now it's the 10th. You don't have it. And then you could say, yeah, but nobody really needed this by the 1st anyway. I've heard that. Well, right? they just make up deadlines, so. Yeah, so it wasn't important. I didn't feel, you know, I had other things to do. I had empty the wastebaskets because you... <laughs> We had that fire drill, you know, so. Um, so that's the next step. Is agree the importance of it. If they don't think, they don't agree on the facts or they agree on the facts, but they don't think it's important. Well, everybody has a lot of bugs in their programs. I mean, yeah. you know, that's just natural. Right? You, can't, you can't get them out. There's no such thing as a bug-free program. Um, so, um, and then you can start, see from that, there's a base that you, you agree with the facts and you agree with the importance of them. If you don't have that, you, you're not going anywhere. But you have to work on that. Yeah. Okay. So, for example, uh, well, I thought you said the first and you say you said the tenth. How can we improve this? You know, let's, 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 can we work out a system? Let's talk about it. And if you call a system where we write down, you write down, sign your name to it. This is the date to agree to. Or it could be that you say, well, you know, I said the 10 and you kept pressuring me to right. bring, bring the thing down. And I, I didn't know how to do it by the first but you made me finally say. I gave in. You gave in so you'd stop pressuring me. Yeah. Or you said, you said around the first. Tenth yeah. seems around the first, right? You say what year on the first. <laughs> right, yeah. No, no. So, so what needs to be corrected there is not the programmer, but the communication that you have with the programmer. Yeah. And then I guess the same thing applies with the, the importance, the consequence. Right. If I just told you the boss wanted it done by the first so that he could tell the board it was done last year, you might view it very differently than if it's done by the first, we win a $10 million contract. Yeah, yeah. And then you could come back and say, well, let's say we're a month before the first and you're telling me that we win a $10 million contract. And I say, well, you know, there's this tool that we use in development that costs $19.95. And I put in a request for this tool and you turned it down so we don't have the budget for it. That's $19.95. And, and it's going to be worth $10 million if I get this on time. And I'm telling you, this will help me get it on time. But you wouldn't approve it. And that doesn't make any sense. Right? And then it may come out and then I might say to you, well, you know, Marcus, you're always wanting to buy this stuff and it, it, it isn't really going to help you. And you could come back and say, well, you know what? For $20, you could test that out. Maybe this time it does make a difference. Right. And I've literally had that happen over and over again with managers who are insisting that there's millions of dollars at stake and won't spend $20 or even less for someone. 
collecting and stuff. You know, and sometimes the programmers just spend the money out of their own pocket to get stuff. And, and I feel like that $20 conversation, you know, I've been on, I guess I've been on both sides of it, been the manager who said, Jerry, you always want a $20 gadget. You're always convinced the next doohickey is going to save you 90% of the time. It never really works. But like we got a whole pile of gadgets over here we've bought and frameworks and debuggers and uh, nothing's ever better. So I just want you to get it done. Uh, it's um, and then I would say to you, Marcus, how do you know that nothing's ever better? Ah, that sounded like a fact. It was almost like it appeared like a fact, but it wasn't at all a fact, was it? Well, you know, some, somehow you, this interpretation you're making, I mean, who, who knows what it would be if you hadn't bought these things? <laughs> Darn it, Jerry. Now I don't have my facts straight, so we have to go back and debate or agree upon well, expectations. Oh, well, it's true. I, I don't it know. Is. Are better or not, but uh, I looked at the records and you like you bought these seven pieces of uh, supposedly tools, and they've never been checked out. Nobody ever even installed them. Right. Uh, and uh, maybe just buying them makes them go faster, but I don't know how that works. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Maybe you could tell me how owning a license to something, uh, to a car that never gets driven, I, maybe it improves your life somehow. I don't, yeah, yeah. So I don't words, know. If we don't have the facts in agreement, then, then if the arguments go nowhere, then and, and, and there's just be arguments that don't lead to any useful stuff. You know, I feel like our conversation today has really captured this topic that somehow programmers, programming, people aren't just like cogs in a giant manufacturing warehouse and a giant manufacturing process. Nobody has to explain to a cog, you know, nobody has to negotiate. Nobody has to get an agreement with a machine. Mm -hmm. We're, and yet I feel like this, this theme that there's so many um, people managing software teams in the same way as you'd man manage a, a a lot of other things where there's very few humans involved, maybe an assembly line of, of well, robots. Realize, take, take your analogy. See, there's certain things a cog can't do. If somebody drops a wrench in the, in the gears of a machine, the gears don't know that, oh, gee, there's a wrench, we better stop turning right now or we're gonna, okay? Presumably a person who's a cog in your machine sees a wrench being dropped in, might have the sense to say, wait a minute, let's not grind on this wrench, right? That's what you're paying for, right? The, um, you know, if they don't do that, you know, if they don't have the sense to do that, then of course you're not getting what you paid for. And this great dream that I've watched for over 60 years, of, we're gonna get a program. Right. Replace programmers. Wouldn't that be great? Well, and, and I've seen literally you know, companies spend billions on this dream. And of course, where they get the dream is from some programmers. <laughs> We're going to write this program that's going to eliminate programmers. And the reason, they, and you buy, you trust these programmers because you don't trust programmers. You trust the special programmers who make the program that didn't. And I think in the 90s, we saw a lot of tools come out that were going to generate applications. You fill out a screen and you hit a button and it would build it for you. I, that's my impression, at least. But and the fact is, see, the fact is, and this, this is better known in England. This is another expression that we don't seem to have in the American language. Do you know the expression work to rule? No. No, so you know, in England, it's very, you have a lot of industries that are, for some reason or another, are not allowed to strike. Okay. Really. What you do uh, is you set up a work to rule, like you're in the post office, the postal workers are not allowed to strike. Right. So instead of striking, they just follow every rule. A work to every rule. That's what work to rule. So it essentially gets nothing done. Nothing, absolutely nothing. Well, they are working like cogs in a machine. The, the cogs follow the rules exactly. And so the rule is keep spinning. And if somebody drops a wrench in, you wreck the whole machine. And it worked to rule is much more effective than a strike. 
You want to stop any big organization and some small ones, you want to stop them from functioning. You just follow every single rule. You just follow all the rules. Uh, I feel like I've, I've seen teams that, that learned that behavior um, mm -hmm. for, for a variety of different reasons. Um, it's the way of rebelling against the boss. Uh, you can, uh, the, the great uh, textbook on this subject is um, Good Soldier Schweik. Do you know the book? I don't. Oh, you ought to get this. Okay, Good Soldier Schweik, S C H W E I K, I think is so. I'm not sure about the spelling. I'm going to get this book. It's translated from, I think, originally in Czech uh, or German. This soldier Schweik is. He's a perfect soldier. He's a perfect cog. He obeys every order exactly and brings the whole Austro-Hungarian empire to its knees. Is this like a moral tale, uh, you know, sort of a humorous thing? Humorous book. I mean, it's a riot unless you happen to be <laughs> yeah. part of the story. That's what I was going to say. If, if it starts to look like a mirror, then maybe um, maybe there's a problem. So, But... But Shrike was, uh, you know, was yes, he just followed those orders. And, and it's beautifully, you know, it's, it's a real classic. It's, it's, you may find it on the web uh, for free as far as I know. Um, Maybe we can post a link to it in the show notes or something. Just be sure you're, you're wearing your, uh, your special underwear because you probably wet your pants laughing. Oh, <laughs> you're special. Okay, we won't be posting a link to special underwear. We'll let you find those um, wherever you want to find them. Um, well, Jerry, this has been great. Uh, I, I've got a whole list of other things we can talk about next time from this, including um, some accidental misspellings such as non-boarding and le leaning out over your skills that I've recently seen that I thought had some, uh, I don't know why, I thought they were funny, especially non-boarding, because I see that happening more and more with hiring companies. So we can talk about that or other things next time we get together. Okay. Um, now, Jerry, we wanted to, uh, we don't really have a name for this show, and that was your idea, right? Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter whose idea it was. <laughs> well, that's true. But what was your idea for getting a name? Uh, well, we asked our listeners what they think would be the right name. And so, if you're listening and you've enjoyed this, and even if you haven't, you want to help us name this thing, we'd love to hear from you. So, why don't you send, uh, you can send me an email at marcus at marcusblankenship.com. Jerry, can they write you an email? Well, they can, but it's better to go through you. Okay. I'll collect them and then we'll come up with a name. Who knows? I think each week we'll be talking about all kinds of stuff from learning to software to leading, whatever strikes our fancy. Good. Thank you very much. Let us hear from you. Yes, we look forward to it. Oh, send your questions too, because if we run out of stuff, which probably wouldn't happen, that's one thing, but it's so much more interesting when we get to hear from you. So if you're listening and you have anything question-wise, you can also send those to Marcus at MarcusBlankenship.com. And we'll give your questions uh, priority over ours. Absolutely. Just be sure the spelling is all correct. Perfect. It must be perfect, right? Yeah. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Jerry. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.